The original idea that Chris and I talked about when we were thinking about this episode that you're about to listen to is loneliness, what it is, why it matters, and what we can do about it. But that turned out to only be a little piece of what we really wanted to talk about. Loneliness is an important topic for sure, but the bigger issue has to do with building connections with each other and within a society that so often feels fragmented. So we do tackle loneliness, but building connections is the big theme of what we want to discuss in today's episode. It's a topic that we see as absolutely critical for the flourishing of everyone, both as individuals and as a society. So stay tuned for a thought-provoking and at times rather passionate discussion of loneliness and building connections for a better life. Welcome to the Indigo Podcast, an exploration of human flourishing at work and beyond. I'm Ben Barron of Indigo Anchor and Cleveland State University. And I'm Chris Everett of Indigo Anchor. For more information, please visit us at www.indigopodcast.com. Hey, Chris, good to be doing a podcast with you again. I know. We're building out this amazing curriculum that you guys can find out about if you subscribe to our Substack. We won't waste a whole bunch of time on this, but it's called Good Leaders Do This. It's based on a whole host of our work, but we've missed podcasting and it's definitely something we're committed to. That's right. So I just encourage everybody to go to elevatingwhatworks.substack.com to learn more about Good Leaders Do This, which is our awesome leadership development program and all of our other content that we put at elevatingwhatworks.substack.com. So what are we going to talk about in today's episode, Chris? Loneliness. Loneliness. This is something that I've been thinking about and sometimes I experience in my life and and something that I definitely think about. Ben, what's the time you've been lonely? Hmm. I think my loneliness level probably decreased significantly post marriage. I don't know. Uh, we, my wife and I have a very, <laughs> we, have, we, have, we have a phenomenal relationship. I don't know. And, and I feel like I don't feel socially isolated, uh, which is what we'll talk about in terms of a definition of loneliness. Uh, but I, I think thinking back to times before that, perhaps um, when I was, you know, maybe when I was in college to some degree, when I was younger, uh, some of those early days in my professional career. Uh, when I wasn't quite as well connected with other folks, um, those were probably some times when I felt a little bit more lonely. Um, but today's episode isn't just about loneliness. We're going to go way beyond loneliness. But those are some times for me. How about you? You know, I I moved around a lot. My dad was in the Air Force. So it was always quick meet people when you move someplace. And then I got to say that I think a lot of how I view and think about the world puts me in a place where... I think very differently than the people that I'm around at any time. Now I have a pretty wide ranging social group and people that I know and care about from a whole host of different backgrounds. But yeah, sometimes I can feel just really alone, even in the presence of other people. Right. Well, and that brings us to this idea of what loneliness even is. And I think the first key distinction we have to make is that loneliness is different, very different than just being alone. You can be totally alone and not be lonely. So you can also be surrounded by others, uh, by lots of people, and in those instances still feel quite lonely. So it's this idea of perceived social isolation, Uh, regardless of whether or not you're around other people in physical proximity to them or otherwise. Uh, So it's, it's all about that feeling of social isolation. And maybe, you know, kind of as you mentioned, you might be in certain social situations in which you think very differently or you just aren't really connecting with the people around you. And that can make you feel lonely, even in the middle of a big party, even. Uh, And I can certainly resonate with that. You know, there have been instances perhaps where uh, the conversations weren't going very well and it just didn't feel like I was in sync with the folks around me. And it's like, this isn't really very fun. And that's kind of this sense of loneliness. And I, I think if that happens just, you know, once during a party or if you have those feelings just uh, at various times, that's not really chronic loneliness that we're talking about there. Um, but I think, you know, this, this idea of loneliness is something that's very important and is something that um, is pervasive. And we're all going to feel that at certain points in our uh, in our lives. Yeah. So anytime you have something that's all over the place, um, 
researchers are going to study this. And this loneliness, I'm sure if anybody's been on the web, they've heard of this, the loneliness epidemic and all of this stuff to where, Ben, you were telling me that our government has some stuff about this. <laughs> what? It's a, it's really interesting. There's a lot of stuff out there about loneliness. And I wouldn't take it for granted that everybody, all of our listeners have heard about the loneliness epidemic, although it has been covered a bit in the media. But the governments of both the United Kingdom and the United States have declared in various ways that loneliness is a health epidemic that and they have a variety of ideas around how to try to fix it. And, you know, we could go on and on about whether or not we think it's the government's job to fix these types of things or what the government can even do policy wise to fix individual loneliness. There's, I, I think, probably some bigger issues that are less government related at work there. Uh, but but sure, there are a lot of people who are noticing um, kind of at a, a research level that this is a problem. And, uh, you know, we can think about this in a, in a few different ways. One, one way that I like to kind of more tease out what something is in, in terms of how we define it in social science is to look at how we measure it. Mm. And because uh, that can be really helpful. And so um, should we measure some loneliness here, Chris? Yes, let's. <laughs> All right. you, you have five loneliness. <laughs> <laughs> you are very lonely um so <laughs> is that on a scale of zero to 100 or is that on a scale of like seven <laughs> no so actually the, what i'm gonna propose here to you and share with you is just one measure of loneliness but it's one that's used per fairly frequently um and by the way if folks are interested we'll post a link in the um in the show notes uh, to an article in which I have a bunch of more information about all these different things. But, uh, you know, one of the uh, ways in which we measure loneliness is a three item scale. So it's three questions and there's just three answers to each one that you can pick. So I want you to think about yourself. Think about your life, dear listeners. And Chris, think about your life. The next questions are about how you feel about different aspects of your life for each one Tell me how often you feel that way. Do you want to actually take this, Chris? And you can you can tell me. I we mean, can give you a loneliness score. Maybe you're feeling insecure right well, now. I, you know, some of the <laughs> things is it's like how often do you feel like you lack companionship? I have a ton of companions. Okay, okay. Well, yeah. we're gonna rate this. All but, right. So, but how one. should I think about like are these like deep bosom buddies? Are these just well, dudes first I of all, hang I out with? No, I have no idea what a bosom buddy is. Um, but <laughs> I know something is that see right that you don't <laughs> if you don't understand the term how can you answer how do they handle that Ben it's like it's the, on average it doesn't matter that much right and I mean so I'm yes so everybody not has average a, Ben you're you're I far, broke the scale <laughs> I was I was gonna say above average but you're so uh, you're like on a different vector like if we if you're in the sub <laughs> southern hemisphere and you're above average. All Are right, you below get, average for the well, northern hemisphere? <laughs> yes. All right. Let's get back to measuring measuring your loneliness and just stop okay. quibbling with it. All just, right. Just do it. Okay. All right. All right. First, how often do you feel that you lack companionship? One, hardly ever. Two, some of the time. Or three, often. Uh, two, some of the time. Okay, so two. And and really, if going back to more serious answer to your question, how do we handle that? I mean, it, for this type of question, this is a perceptual type question. So it's however you define com companionship to some degree, right? Yeah, sure. Um, so the, it's in the eye of the boulder. Okay, so you said some of the time you feel like you lack companionship. Number Question number two, how often do you feel left out? Number one, hardly ever. Number two, some of the time. Or three, often. Some of the time. Some of the time. Okay, so another Score of two there. Last question. How often do you feel isolated from others? Is it one, hardly ever, two, some of the time, or three, often? Often. Often. So that means, okay, so we can add these up. This is, this, again, this is kind of crude way of measuring this. I know, this, this is it's, like it's really blunt, vulnerable. Hot lobster, right? This, 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 is, this is a blunt instrument. But if we, <laughs> you, you said, you basically had answers of two, two, and three. Yeah. So two, two plus two is four. Four plus three is seven. So guess what? You qualify in the range of lonely on a re, as, as far as some researchers have defined it. They define it, right? So, well, yeah, um, we were talking a, about that. I was like, yeah. man, Ben, I've been feeling lonely. I, I got to be honest. And then that kind of what led to us 
talking yeah. about this. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So, but give, six, give them the scales so they can rate, if they t- wanted to take it themselves, how would they need to think right. about it? So if, if you had a score, you know, if you, so if you add up your scores on each one of those items, you'll end up with something from three to nine, right? So uh, if you are a three to five, you're more in the not lonely category. And if you're on the six to nine, you're more on the lonely side of things. So you were a seven. So you're yeah, I'm mid lonely. lonely. That's all right. You're mid, you're mid, you're, 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 you're on mid. On a scale to six to nine, <laughs> I'm a seven. So I'm like mid low lonely. <laughs> so it could, it, it could be worse. Um, Nothing so. that a good IPA and a donut couldn't fix. <laughs> <laughs> Let us put on the record that <laughs> drinking alcohol and consuming uh, donuts is not a, a healthy coping strategy. Okay. So these questions, look at three different facets of loneliness, relational connectedness, social connectedness, and self-perceived isolation, which are these different ways that we can look at loneliness. And again, as I mentioned earlier, many people experience loneliness at some point in their lives. That's completely normal. It's expected. Uh, But the problem, and this is why some of our governments, you know, in the UK and US have really started to take a look at this as a public health issue, is that when people do live with chronic loneliness, it takes a negative toll on their physical and their mental health. It's a no joke problem. Yeah, it's um, I can say for myself, like it, it has been a challenge. My loneliness has been a challenge for me and how I feel day to day. Now I've got good stuff going in my life. I love my work environment. I have these different things, but What's interesting about this scale, right? So it measures the t- three types of loneliness, at least for these researchers, which is relational connectedness, which is, you know, having quality relationships with other people, social connectedness, having to feel like you're part of a group, and self perceived isolation, which is like your subjective sense of whether you're separated from others or not, right? And mm-hmm. so. Where was I going? <laughs> I, I think I got you all flustered by making you self-rate your loneliness. There, no, but you I said, you, that, but no, you start off by saying that this is has been a a problem, right? That it's something that you've but, noticed. No, no, this is yourself. exactly where I was going because I yeah. lost, I got lost in my loneliness for a moment. <laughs> the um, <laughs> pull no, up, pull up. Notice how none of those things have to do of if you have enough money or not, mm. if you like your job or not, if you um, are happy with your marriage. Now, I'm sure there's other research that, you know, those will have an impact on your perceptions of well-being. But there's a place where everything, you could literally be winning at everything and alone. Right. Well, and actually, there's some evidence to suggest that, you know, if you're, for example, really wealthy or if you're a celebrity, it's actually much easier to be lonely because you're so different from so many other people and – even though maybe many people, millions of people, if you're Taylor Swift, everyone wants to be socially connected with you, but you have to be extremely careful with your relationships when you're in that position. But how bizarre is that? You want to be socially connected to somebody you don't even know. Yeah, I get it. Right? That's bizarre. So, well, maybe. I mean, people really like Taylor Swift's music, but that's, I mean, setting that to the side the person like for Taylor Swift herself, she has to be very careful because she it, people that may have a wider range of motives to want to be associated with her than of they may, <laughs> than, than maybe people who want to be associated with me, right? So, um, so it's, it can be even more problematic for them to develop when when you are really wealthy or maybe are in a a very um, you know, you're, you're a celebrity to have those genuine relationships because or just, something something even less crazy than that like there is a relationship between intelligence and loneliness and the types of you know they find that like really smart people tend to just figure out their own problems and solve it like there's some research that's based on that um and there's just like any place where you're different than the large group or cohort can it doesn't have to, but it can drive some of those things. Sure. I, I wish it was that I was extremely intelligent and that was – I'm so lonely because I'm so smart, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> I mean – I don't want to throw that out there to our listeners. <laughs> if, if, that may, if that makes you feel better. Yeah, you're um, just like – 
So <laughs> this is a cross I must bear. <laughs> so, lo- so loneliness is painful. Obviously, it's painful because it's it's you know something that we don't like experiencing. But even beyond that. There are some negative health outcomes that come with it. And this kind of points even more to why loneliness really matters. So, for example, and this was in a report that uh, so NPR pulled together um, a number of these statistics for an article. And they, they talked about how you know the physical consequences of poor connections with others can be devastating, including a 29 percent increased risk of heart disease, a 32 percent increased risk of stroke and a 50% increased risk of developing dementia for older adults, right? This is... 50%. 50%. And, you know, that's one of the biggest things that has come out, you know, in recent years with regard to aging and dementia, mental health as you age, is keeping your mind active, which includes having strong social connections, social interactions with other people. It really does matter, it seems. Yeah, it's it's hard to just quantify that spread out. You know, when you think of when we had the COVID problem, some mm. people were really flippant and said, well, it only kills 1%. That's like over 3 that, million people in the U- U.S. Mm. But when you've got stats like these and you look at loneliness as a public health problem, now, I'm not saying government or something can solve this necessarily. This is a sticky wicket, right? Yep. But the regardless of what you think, this is a massive public health challenge. It is. And part of the problem, too, is that um, you know, the research suggests that across age groups, people are spending less time with each other in person than they were two decades ago. Uh, and, you know, especially among young people who are age 15 to 24, um, one report suggested that they had 70% less social interaction with their friends. Um, we have a lot of ways in which we connect with people digitally, but there it still doesn't seem to be the same psychologically it's, and for our it's health. Not, it's not as good. And Ben, I feel, now this piece, disclaimer, this is not evidence-based. This is just my anecdotal observations. I feel like coming out of the pandemic, I've seen more agitation that people have and they have done stuff where it's like people are less connected now. Mm. Our social ties have weakened due to the isolation and all the stuff that went down during that time. And it probably depends on what your social connections looked like before. True. And right, if those were severely disrupted and then didn't return to normal, I think that that probably would be an indicator of, you know, even more pronounced social isolation. But you know, I guess the uh, the big takeaway here is that loneliness matters. It's a problem. We're all going to experience it to some degree, uh, but there are too many people who experience it at a chronic level, and it can have uh, really really negative outcomes for them in terms of their health. Uh, and so then that brings us to the natural question of, well, if this is a problem, what can we do about it? How might we try to address loneliness? And as I mentioned, you know, there are a handful of different things that the the surgeons general of um the uh the united states and i guess is they call it a surgeon general over in the uk maybe whatever the equivalent of that over head across, medical uh, person yes uh, ac- across the pond um <laughs> they uh they have various ideas but there was an article in the atlantic in which a psychologist who's done a fair amount of research on loneliness uh you know there's an interview with this guy his name's um i'm gonna butcher his last name but it was john Kako, so Kakiopo? Kakiopo? Yeah, that's probably it. We'll go with that. I didn't have time to try to figure out how to pronounce that. So sorry, John. Psychologist John. John Phonics cuts yeah. both we'll, ways. <laughs> we'll, we'll, just, we'll just call him Psychologist John. Yeah. He, he outlined a handful of ways in which to address loneliness in this article that was published in The Atlantic. And he has a little acronym for it. And we'll we'll pull this apart a little bit. And then I think in uh, kind of as we move forward, say, well, you know, maybe this is only one kind of level one of, of this whole yeah, problem. And, and by the way, spoiler, <laughs> this isn't just about, okay, you're lonely. And so now do these things and then have, be happy. This, this, what we're going to talk about today is way more comprehensive, but anyway, for keep sure, going. for sure. Keep going. So, so this acronym is ease, E-A-S-E. 
This is the idea of easing your way back into social connections. So the first E stands for extend yourself. Uh, but the problem is you, you have to do this in the right way. You have to extend yourself safely because if you are feeling like you're socially isolated, then you're going to be on this heightened sense of threat. So any kind of uh, threat that you perceive in a social interaction could reinforce your beliefs that, hey, this is not going to work out for me. I'm going to I'm not good at interacting with people. And it could actually make you more socially isolated or at least feel that way. So being careful, doing a little bit at a time is important. Um, so extend yourself safely. The A is for action plan. Uh, you know, acknowledge that it's hard for you. Uh, know that that's a normal thing if you're lonely, to, that it's difficult. Um, and, you know, becoming reconciled with the fact that most people may not like you, and that's okay. And that's just the way life is. It better be I, okay, Ben, or I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, come on, guys. Like, if you're, if you are a certain way, right? Um, that doesn't mean you can't change and grow. But you have to have some values about who you want to be as a person. Like if you live in a low trust environment, and I've, I've met this in some people that I know that have come out of some really bizarre situations of poverty, where the people they grew up around were not trustworthy. We're not trustworthy. The parents that were supposed to take care of them were not trustworthy characters. And they eventually just stood on their own two feet and said, you know what? I'm going to have different values. They put themselves through college. Like, so just because the, the people around you may legitimately be a little messed up. That's sure. probably not politically correct term, but I'm going to use that to shorten the conversation. The people around you may lack integrity and not be good brokers of your quality as a person and be okay with that. Sure. And, you know, it, it, practically speaking, if you're trying to build a social connection with someone and you're taking these little steps into social environments, um, asking people about themselves is one way to start. It's a simple way to start to have a conversation with people, get them talking about their interests. The S in ease stands for seek collectives. So looking for people who have similar, similar values, similar interests, activities, uh, this just makes it easier to find some synergy with people. If you go out there and you for example, volunteer at an organization and you are working alongside someone, it's pretty easy to start striking up a conversation with someone in that way. And you already know that you have something in common. So that's one way to do it. And then the last piece is expect the best, that last E of ease. Uh, so try to uh, be positive <laughs> try to have an optimistic outlook when you are attempting these things. Uh, and this can try to help counteract that hypervigilance that most of us may feel if we're trying to overcome loneliness, when we're trying to get back out there, so to speak, among people and build those connections. Yeah. So let's do a quick review. So it's ease, E-A-S-E. -E. So extend yourself safely. You know, take some safe risk. If it's a low integrity person, maybe you don't want to invest your time easing out there. You know, that'd be a bad investment, right? So extend yourself safely. Do it a little bit at a time. Action. Have an action plan. Recognize that it might be hard for you. Other people, it might not. You might just be busy. But having an action plan, it's like, you know what? Gosh darn it. I need to put some time on my calendar to get out there. That was, Ben, we had to, ben had to put some time on his calendar to get out there. Because for a while, he was just lost in academia and all the work he's done. Ben, Ben's like a super productive person. And putting some action plan for Ben to do some fun and social things was important, right? You remember that? Sure, but I, I still rank better on the lonely scale than you. Yeah, I know. Well, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's like last time I'm vulnerable on air. No. <laughs> All right. So E, extend yourself. A, have an action plan. It could be hard for you. It couldn't not. Just have... Have some action to do something about your loneliness. No action, you're going to be stuck, right? S, seek collectives. People will, that are similar to you or have similar interests. You're into music, great, music. You're into debate team, you know, whatever. Um, and then the last part is expect the best. Don't go in there with a distorted reality. Don't let your mind trick you out of having all the awesome non-lonely fun that you could be having when you're following your action plan, is it going to be a bumpy road? Maybe, maybe not. If you can see the future, 
you'd be living on an island full of people that loved you like Taylor Swift. You know, <laughs> we wouldn't be having this conversation. So expect the best because you can't tell the future. And every day is a new day. There you go. So I mentioned at the beginning in the intro that this wasn't just an episode about loneliness. And it's not because when we started talking about loneliness, we thought, well, yes, that's a problem. And we certainly should try to help people by providing some evidence-based ways perhaps to go about counteracting loneliness. But it seems like there's much more here. And that more is perhaps about building even broader connections between people and also uh, trying to strengthen the ties within society itself. Uh, so we, we thought about this kind of as like level two, right? So level one, you're maybe not lonely per se. But level two is, all right, well, you know, okay, I, I, I'm not lonely. Uh, I feel good. I maybe have my quote unquote tribe, my people that I uh, can uh, interact with and, and not feel that social isolation. Um, but it seems like there's maybe something more here too, right? Yeah. So I think, and these articles, we kind of just summarized what's been in a bunch of articles. You're lonely. Okay, here's ways you could do something about it. Loneliness epidemic is killing people everywhere. Here's three easy steps with a shot of Windex. Don't drink Windex. That you could do to cure your loneliness today. But that lacks imagination. And to me, I view as like just decadence. Is life just about finding self-gratification? Is that is that really where you find it's like, okay, I'm going to go find... I'm going to put myself out there, find an echo chamber of people that make me feel good about myself and then die one day. Barf. Yeah. That's yeah. Well, barf. And, and I think that was that was where the conversation that you and I had when we were prepping yeah. this episode kind of took a turn. You were like, well, that advice is fine and it might help you. To, That's the beginning of right, wisdom. Right. But but the pro I think the one piece of it that we keyed in on was this idea of, you know, finding people who, you know, share all of your interests, share your values and so forth. That it's good to have that, right? But what if you all isn't it is it not also important perhaps to build connections with people who don't have the same interests, the same values, uh the same activities as you do. Yeah. This is this is, you know, how do we pay level 2 loneliness kung fu? <laughs> All right. <laughs> so getting beyond yourself. Now, I think if you are really, really lonely and are having a hard time, like to where it's impacting your physicality, start mm -hmm. with that easy stuff. Go find some people Absolutely. that like the same stuff. But after that, once you're like doing OK, I want to encourage you to start to have some imagination beyond that. And some of this relies on some communication theory. Well, one of the fundamental challenges that we talk about a lot in terms of human communication and, and interaction, kind of interpersonal relationships, is this question of can you ever have shared understanding with another person? You know, you're in your brain, Chris. I'm in my brain. How do we actually achieve this thing that we call a shared understanding about anything? And this can really start to cook your noodle if you think about it for too long, because we use language oftentimes to try to build a shared understanding. There are other ways that we can build shared understanding, but language is one of them. Uh, we use symbols. You know, one way that we <laughs> some communication theorists have talked about, you know, humans are uh, meaning making symbol using creatures. Uh, we use symbols. Words are symbols. But even the word, you know, symbol might be mean something different to you than it does to me. So it's a challenge of language, a challenge of interaction to build shared understanding with people. It's a lifelong endeavor. I don't think it's anything that you can ever completely achieve um, to, to truly, you know, quote unquote, know someone um, or to even really kind of know yourself. And so uh, that is a challenge. We are, in a sense existentially separate from other people yeah and some of this stuff comes from marriage and family literature where people are looking for this like emotional fusion where you are you get you're so in sync so one it's like your every individual cell is touching every under individual cell of their person and 
that's just not real. Now, in movies and in books and in fictions and the stories that we tell each other, like a lot of people will glorify these kinds of relationships that are written about. They're a fantasy. It's not real. We have theory of the mind. When somebody talks to us, we look at their body language. You know, people say a lot of that you know, communication's nonverbal, and it is. But is this person making me feel comfortable? I'm hearing the words they're saying. But sociopaths play people like a fiddle because they know how to signal relaxed, I'm trustworthy. They're able to use words in a manipulative way. But because we can't read somebody's mind, we only have a theory, a working construct that we invent in our own mind about, hey, is that person happy or sad? Are they feeling good today? Do they like me? That's all a figment that you've made up. And somebody could be lying or playing you on that side. And that's because we are absolutely separate. Now, that doesn't mean we can't build intimacy and closeness and friendship. It just means that there's a massive reality paradox that makes it challenging. So what does that look like perhaps in a marriage context when one person thinks that the other person should be a mind reader? What does that, what, what does that look like? You know, gosh, it's, it's everywhere. It's, it's a trite thing that I would be. Well, what's an example of it? Uh, well, you know, generally you have like one spouse who'll say, well, you're not meeting your, my needs or you don't love me or something. And meanwhile, the other person's reality is like, dude, I've been doing everything I thought. Mm -hmm. And you just didn't know. Like, so you have to build those bridges of understanding and you have to check in with each other. Now, if you're doing this right early in your dating relationship or early in your marriage, you are creating what this guy named John Gottman, who runs the Love Lab, calls love maps, maps of that person's brain. And you, this goes to anything. Like if I notice, Ben, that you're assuming something about my thinking, I have to say, wait, wait, no, actually, I'm thinking this. And then we update. So hopefully, as the years go by, when you're with somebody, any type of relationship, you can have that level of closeness because they've known you for so long that they kind of, because you've brought them into your world, know how you think. Mm -hmm. Right. And over time, it can perhaps even start to approximate this feeling that you can read someone's mind, even though you can't. Uh, but over time and with the right communication, we can. Your conjecture start, gets we, pretty yeah, good. We can get we can get close. And, uh, you know, it kind of funny example Remember in the movie Frozen when um, Anna and the the guy like she that she just met they were going to get engaged and they have the little song they sing and it's like we finish each other's and then the one person says sandwiches and yeah. it was funny because like uh, the the funny thing there is like the idea is that it, you know someone really well you can finish their sentences and then he says sandwiches it's just it's funny because they obviously don't know each other very well but uh, so I I think the trick here is how do you Continue to build connections with other people um, in, if you don't have things that are in common with them, right? If you don't have common values, if you don't have, um, you know, common interests. And is that really even necessary? What do you think? Well, I, I think the values piece comes, can be really important. But because you're existentially separate, because you cannot read each other's mind, the way that any kind of bridge, now you're right, hanging out with your bowling alley buddies could be great. But that is only one level of relationship and intimacy, right? And that doesn't mean you have to be like, you know, the term we that we don't know how to really define, bosom buddies with everybody, right? <laughs> but But because we're existentially separate, I think it opens up an amazing opportunity to explore each other's worlds. Now, what's funny to me is conflict happens early. When you start to explore other worlds, you might be scandalized by what somebody thinks, right? But before you get to the, I think people go to the conflict way too fast. There are things worth fighting over, values, things that are worth fighting or disagreeing or maybe not being friends with somebody anymore. 
Sure. But I never see the level of exploration of each other's worlds that make it really interesting. Mm -hmm. They they go to the conflict too early. You told me a story about a friend that you had who stopped talking to you because of your differing views on like meat production, I think, or something, something like that. Yeah, I've I've had it was it was a while um, that yeah. They're definitely dealing with the moral implications of meat consumption. I'm not at that place where they are at. Mm -hmm. And so it was like there was a bit of a break there. And it's kind of interesting because it was really awesome because he really was like living his values. And there was more to explore there than there was to have some conflict there. And we had some time where... We both went through our own processes and stuff, and I'm delighted to say that we still chat and are really good friends to this day. Okay, so still talking. That's good. But there um, was more exploration that was more interesting yeah. than letting the conflict be the end of the story. Sure, sure. So what happens if we just kind of stay at our own echo chamber, so to speak, if we stay at our own silos, we don't maybe have those t more challenging types of relationships that that make us think a little bit more? Well, one of the things are our social ties weaken. And, you know, one of the things that I went through, I went through the Harvard School of Negotiations um, curriculum as part of my graduate school stuff. And there's this idea of like, we shouldn't leave any value on the table, right? So mm -hmm. uh, let's say we disagree on 98% of things. 98% of things about you, Ben, make me hate your guts. Well, I'm still living 2%, I'm still leaving 2% value on the table where we could collaborate. The biggest story of humanity from our evolution of language and everything is we're better collaborating. You have more wealth. So like in a fictional world where there's only a butcher, a baker, and a candlestick maker, Great, we can all eat cheeseburger by candlelight. Awesome. But then somebody else comes in and has an iPod, right? And they're a little hipster, you know, because they still have an iPod and not an iPhone. But uh, no, right? So the, adding one other person increases the wealth of that group by like whatever, 25%, right? Because you have somebody else there. And so if we stack up a whole community and the value that they can have, all of our lives are richer and it also recognizes the fact that nobody's story's done until they're dead and if they did it right maybe their story exceeds past their death right who i am now it has is massively different than who i was as a teenager and i have grown and my story today if i'm doing life right in my value system who i am in the future is going to be deeper richer and more growth some of that growth, probably really painful personally, right? And so if you disagree with somebody, 98%, which would be a lot, you're missing out on that 2% uh, present value that they have now and what might grow to 100% stuff in common. I had some stupid ideas in high school. And if people had just written me off and given up on me, they wouldn't have had the value of myself now. And sure. I, I think that's... And so that's the idea of social ties weakening. We are better together. Now, there's a lot of numbskulls and jack wagons. We talk about them on this podcast all the time. But the hope is, and I call it leaving the light on for somebody, that it shows. Sure. Well, and one of the problems is that we used to have institutions that cut across various different tribes a little bit better than we have now. And I'm thinking particularly about faith institutions. Uh, where more people participated in them and you could very easily be, you know, just practically speaking, going to the same church with somebody who votes for somebody completely different than you every single time and is in a different socioeconomic uh, strata, right? Uh, there are all these different types of differences and those types of social institutions, be they civic organizations or faith-based or whatever, um, are on the decline. And in the absence of them, because we are social creatures, it seems that we have gravitated towards our social media encouraged echo chambers where we're 
around a bunch of people who think about perhaps, you know, political or other types of things in just very similar ways. Not only and, that, but you're in that chamber with, yeah, yeah, that stupid other party. Mm. And you share you share anger inciting memes that show how dumb and messed up the other side is. Yeah, yeah. Like, and I like some it. of those memes, by the way. I, I'm a human <laughs> too, guys. You're like, gosh, those guys are right. jack wagons. But what does that really do to us? And, and that's part of the challenge of of you know we have a podcast we we have a, a sub stack like where we write blog posts and stuff. And part of the challenge for us has always been: Do you write stuff that's just going to be clickbait? You're going to get more clicks if you put something that's incendiary about another group, right? If I said, you know, click here to watch Chris own the libs on something or own the own the the Republicans on something, right? Doesn't matter and it's which easy. side. Pick pick your group. If you had yeah. if this was a debate team, and like in debate team, you get assigned a position, right? You may not believe in that position, but then you got to go present the best arguments. There are so many nutbags in this world that you could go find evidence that supposedly that person represents a whole group of people. And that's why you should hate them for any side, any topic you could literally. And and there's a term a friend of mine introduced me to. It's this you've heard of the term nitpicking. This is called nut picking. You can always find one nut somewhere in this wide world that can prove your point for you. But this is a, and I, I forget what you, the term you use. You can't, I, one person doesn't represent a whole host. Sure. But sure. that doesn't make it fun when you want to meme trash people, does it? Right. Right, right. Well, so, 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 so going to this point of social isolation and echo chambers where we're hearing and being reinforced with the same ideas, same messages, same memes, same groups of friends uh, through technology, right? If it's a, some sort of social media interaction, uh, that doesn't help us build ties that are more resilient and more interesting beyond you know just the people who we we normally may identify with and there's there's studies that show this people are less likely to know or have fewer friends of the opposite political party right now than they did in the past and we're just using that because everybody that's salient to everyone yeah but social ties weaken when we're only friends with people like us so yeah you if you stay at that level one loneliness intervention which is Find people that make you feel good and have a good time that you should do that. That's not bad. But if you stay there, then you have like echo chamber versus echo chamber. And you actually are leaving a lot of personal wealth that you could be having on the table. No, you got it. The second piece there is, OK, well, what happens when you don't partake, undertake personal growth or build friendships, maybe even intimate friendships with people? And we have examples of this in society um, we'll put it in the snow sh show notes. Uh, ben, what was the name of that 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 a black guy who made friends with one of the head KKK dudes? I don't remember his name, but that's a fascinating story, right? And it was like this is when you think about it, it has so much of our cultural history in that. And then after many years, the guy gave his black friend his KKK hood and stuff, and said, "I'm not in the KKK anymore." I mean, that's mm -hmm. a gross simplification of the story, but this was, this is just like one of these examples with, wow. So social ties weaken. The other piece, it's harder to upgrade tribal knowledge. Think back to old time. If you have one tribe, maybe you meet another tribe that has more advanced medical knowledge. If you don't, but maybe they have a, a an offensive cultural tradition that you don't like. Well, you may never find out that they know how to reset a broken leg. Meanwhile, people that have broken legs in your tribe may die from that lack of knowledge. Because you missed the value that they could add, mm -hmm. right? And a big piece of humanity that is personally disappointing to me, right? This makes me sad because it feels like it's like watching somebody just burn money or pour wealth down the drain is that calcified tribes have a hard time learning from each other that's religious views political views in group out group in communities in companies we see this happen all the time and it gets people to do some pretty dumb things um, sure so how does this tie into the idea of being offended 
and being too easily offended and the idea that perhaps if we are going to critically think about things that sometimes it might hurt some feelings yeah or maybe your own feelings get hurt while you yeah. grapple with something it seems like and you've used the the phrase that we could pro social our way off of a cliff this idea that we value agreement or consensus or just everybody kind of getting along at the expense of making good decisions about things, about trying to figure out better ways forward. And that if we do that, if we're valuing, you know, consensus over, or maybe it's just agreement, I think is a better way to think about it. Just agreeing or friendliness, perhaps we're valuing that above critical thought. Now that can be really problematic. Yeah. That, right. And we see this in uh, communities, right? Everybody's, Oh, hi neighbor. And then they go into their spouse and like, I hate Steve's guts. As a matter of fact, I hate it. I don't even like to watch him mow his lawn. Hmm. You know, I, which which I don't know. Like, okay, I think it's probably okay to not just be hateful to to your neighbor or whatever. But I think a bigger on issues like being critical, a critical thinker about topics that matter, running the risk potentially in certain social situations to offend other people. I think is okay if you are doing it in a thoughtful manner, that doesn't mean that we should just have, I don't think a society that we'd want to live in would be one in which we just all had, you know, no filter whatsoever and just spewed whatever vitriolic remark came into our brains. Here's one, Ben, here's one. You're in a social group and somebody brings up somebody and talks negatively about them. If somebody goes, Hey, wait a minute, guys, I maybe get what you're thinking, but it's not cool because that person's not here to defend themselves. Mm -hmm. People are going to be like, oh, who bumped the record? Hey, maybe don't invite Steve to our social events anymore. But yeah. arguably, stopping that is the moral high ground. Not it that is. you're going around like some, look at me, I'm so holy, but if you can't really talk about what how you think about stuff and people have the resilience to take how you think about stuff Everybody will just smile and be like, ah, ha, 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 right off the cliff. When we're siloed and we only stay with stuff, our social ties weaken. We can't update our tribal knowledge. And then we might just laugh our way into a really bad negative society that is not the best for us living in. Agreed. So let's move now to this idea of level three. Yeah. So but wait, there's more. So first, first <laughs> level, right? We're like all the articles tend to stop at just find people you like and just stop when you feel fine. The second level set is what if feeling fine lacks a little bit of imagination and there's further adventures that could be here that, that we might be able to look at. And that stuff is maybe we explore each other. Then we go to conflict too quickly that we need to be open to cutting across our silos. We need to upgrade our own knowledge and upgrade our tribe's knowledge, that we need to be willing to be social deviants a little bit to help make the world. And before we go to level three, what I'm going to say, what this requires from you personally, the key developmental task at this level is this idea called differentiation. And this comes from family systems theory, this guy named Bowen or Bowen. That's what happens when you read somebody's name and haven't heard somebody say it that knows the guy. But this is where you can be in relationships with other people and don't have to be infected by their current emotional state or even their stinking thinking. That gives you that resilience of, wait, wait, nobody's shooting at me right now. Maybe I can just calm down and really hear what this person has to say. Maybe I can just calm down and say, you know what? I may not be friends with this pe person in the future, but I do want to give myself a moment to fully explore their inner world and the social landscape that they inhabit. Mm -hmm. And let me give you a story about this, Ben, in the National Guard. There's this one guy, he's an enlisted guy. He was so smart. And pe he was just a natural leader. People looked to him. He had gotten his degree. And no, he was going to get his degree. He did some college and then he dropped out. And I was like, dude, why don't you just finish up school and go be an officer? We, you know, there are some things that are messed up here. We could use your help. And he's like, thanks. Thanks for the vote of confidence. And, you know, enough time went by. I said, hey, just 
could you let me into your world a little bit? You know, why, why don't you want to do this? I said, you know, honestly, if I did that, it would separate me so much from the social ties in my family. You know, a lot of people look down on college education. And I've been made fun of even for going to the classes I've gone to. And my social support system is really important to me because I'm a single parent now. And I just don't want to ruffle that boat. Wow. Right? Wow. That that was me getting into his world. Now, I come mm-hmm. from a background of like, man, if you're capable, you should get a college degree. And I, But by shelving some of those narratives that I'd been fed, I was able to step into a world I knew nothing about and really appreciate where this guy was coming from. And so, so we can do that. Google some differentiation stuff. It's really a rabbit hole worth going down. But the key thing is you can be around other people and not fall apart. And there's a wealth of worlds that you can explore there that is really worth doing and it'll help make the world a better place. All right, let's go to level three. So you think, wow, that blew my mind. I hadn't even thinking about that. Oh, One step deeper. (laughs) Here we go. (laughs) So what's level three all about? This is loneliness extreme. No, (laughs) it's like, what, what's a better world look like in a desired end state? This is a place of universal values because you might be leaving that level two stuff that we were talking about and say, well, Uh, the universal values, that's so, that's just trite. That's nonsense. I mean, there are no universal values. I I don't think that's true. And you know, you know? it's not been. You know the, I th- the literature. I think, I, think, I think there's, you know, what's right for you is right for me. You know, you, you decide. You do you. You do you. You only live once. Why? I don't know. That just seems like a, I mean, geez. And why are you giving me such softballs here? <laughs> All right, let's talk about stuff like things that are universal to hu- to the human experience. It's really interesting. If you put one suffering person on television, empathy gets really high. Um, uh, Sam Harris talks about this. Well, remember that girl that fell down the well when we were kids? Mm-hmm. The whole country was riveted. They had like special water cut, rock cutting. They had to dig down beside it, come over. And like the whole country, the United States at least, was like, well, what's the status? You know, the mom was singing songs to her baby girl down in the well. Uh, I think it was a girl that was down there. Everybody was riveted. But literally, millions of people die from malaria and mosquitoes every day. Mm-hmm. But, you know, if it's one person, we really care. If it's a million people. Well, what does this have statistic. to do with universal values? Well, no, it's a universal behavior thing is that if we see one person suffering. That uh, we feel compassion generally, mm-hmm. Right. And then mm-hmm. we also know something that's cool. It's like if a lot of people are are suffering, we don't feel anything, but we can use our thinking brains to maybe do something about it because it's a bigger piece. There are ways that we experience, like we have a neocortex and an amygdala and all this different mm-hmm. stuff that make us humans. I don't know of many people that could see maybe – Maybe their spouse dies in a car wreck and they live across the street where they're not going to feel some kind of like, oh, man, I really hate it for that person. So are you suggesting that we should that perhaps there are things that would be good if we all did them? I mean, what do you think I'm saying, Ben? <laughs> it, seems, it seems to me, seems to me that you are saying that, you know, it, um, you know, it. It seems to me that you're saying that it would be a, a better world if we had people who, you know, bring up the, the idea of, of suffering, right? If we had people who really cared about people who in, in suffering and people who fed the hungry, gave water to the thirsty, they welcomed the stranger, they clothed the naked, they visit the sick, they, you know, visit the imprisoned, that'd be a good world, right? Right. And it's, and I use that example because there's two pieces. There's an emotional piece. Oh my gosh, I I feel something for somebody else and it's driving me to action. But there's also an intellectual piece of I see something and it doesn't matter if I feel positively or negatively about it. Mm -hmm. I should probably respond because, duh, Mm -hmm. you know, like, yeah. 
Yeah. And, you know, if someone doesn't know something, perhaps we should take time to instruct them. And if they're doing something wrong, there's probably an opportunity to admonish, right, in the right context. Um, And it's just it's interesting because, you know, that all sounds, at least in my mind, sounds like good things that would make our world better. But they're also part of stuff that gets rejected pretty frequently in our society. I mean, what I just mentioned were big pieces of the, uh, the what we call the corporal and spiritual works of mercy in the Catholic Church. Yeah. Right? And so if I, you know, but if I put them out that way originally, people would be like, oh, that sounds like a bunch of rules that I got to follow. I don't want to do that. Well, it, it, but that's the challenge. Like a lot of people start thinking about rules or, oh, no, somebody's telling me something. Now I got to do 100% of it. Like Rob Brainerd talks about some of this where, oh, no, I need to do 100 percent of evidence based mm. HR or it, it doesn't count. And he's like, man, why don't you just start doing a little bit? Right. Mm-hmm. And then because we grew up in this society, at least in the United States, that was founded by people with very strict legalistic religious terminologies and, and stuff like that, there's an impact. And the way that we drive clicks or, oh, whole 30, you got to do a whole 30 diet. If you go to day 20, you didn't do the whole 30. But doing 20 was better than doing nothing. Right? But And that, I mean, that's looking at the whole project, right? But when it comes to just dealing with people that you know or meet, I think the people you meet, you have a bit of an obligation to them. They're pe- you're only going to, only so many people are going to flow into your life one-on-one and exploring their world. And hopefully they'll return the, favor and explore some of your world brings a wealth that you wouldn't have just staying with a group of homies that you built up that make you feel good about yourself and never challenge you'll never really grow which means you run the risk of living a life that's not examined or well lived and then you also miss the things where you can uh, connect with people university at uh, universally where how they experience the world matters as well. One thing you mentioned there that I think is really interesting is the idea that many of the people we encounter in our lives, we may only know for a short period of time. Some of the people we know, we probably, if we're related to them, if we're married to them, or if we're good friends, you and I have been friends for a, a number of years, and I suspect we'll be friends for many, many more. And uh, we're very different. And very we are very different. We are very, we are very different. Yeah. Uh, but the but I think the interesting thing about those more fleeting interactions, in addition to our more longstanding ones, is that we have opportunities to in those small interactions to you know breathe a little bit more life into those interactions, being interested in other people, building those social social connections, being available to other people. Versus being too wrapped up in our own ideas and our own priorities and giving people a little bit of time and effort. And, I, you know, there, there have been times where I've probably interacted with people and it really meant a lot to me and to them. It, they probably wouldn't even remember it. And, and yet we also have those experiences with other people and we have those opportunities on a very frequent basis. So making the most of those, I think, is something that can really help. Uh, our organizations, it can help our our personal lives. It can also certainly just help make our society stronger. You know, um, when you're in the child rearing years, if you're somebody that selects to have children, it eats up a lot of your time. And where people develop their relationships are often in like community groups or you're friends with, you know, my kids play with these kids. So then I'm kind of friends. And we use that term friends pretty wantonly in the u.s right oh i've got a friend it's like somebody you've like hung out with twice right versus somebody that you have a deeper thing with but also neighbors are people that we come in contact with proximity plays a big impact on who you have relate because you're busy Mm -hmm. if yeah one of the coolest things to have would be like a next door best friend (laughs) because You could see each other for just three minutes on a day that you're really busy and wave, right? Um, But the amount of people that don't know their neighbors 
and I, I'd have to go pull this up from the Pew Research, but it is horrible. And uh, or they have a light. Hi, Fred. They know their neighbor's name, but they don't chat with them. Mm-hmm. And there's this whole thing that people live out their whole lives. Now they're at the end of their lives and they don't have friends. That's why they go into classmates.com and say, Martha, look, Billy, who I went to school with when I was in second grade. You'll never guess what. You know, he could have had contact with Billy that whole time. And there's times in your life where you'll be plugged in and set into a place in time. And I think it's just really sad if you don't take advantage of those relationships, even though, matter of fact, you should bet on it that they're very different than you and have different values. But the the, the values that they, the the piece that you plug into is not, do they think politically like you do? Do they, are they a person of faith or not faith? It's really that dude, they're a person there with their whole story behind them. And you've really missed, missed out if you haven't explored that some. Yeah. So, you know, we've talked about this idea of kind of this base level loneliness, why it matters and how you can get over it. We've talked about this idea of maybe taking that to the next level and actually building bridges with people who aren't similar to you. And then maybe what this might look like at a a broader societal level if we actually all did this a little bit more. And I think that makes for a much healthier, much more resilient, much more well-functioning type of world. So I guess to bring this in for a landing, what might be some things that that perhaps we all, you know, because I don't think this is necessarily preaching that, hey, we're <laughs> Ben and Chris are doing this perfectly well. We got it all figured out and you, know, you all go do something different. But what can we all do maybe a little bit different to um, to take some of this into action? Well, I think just review the outline of this podcast because we've been feeding you the answers all along. Hey, if you're lonely, go ahead and start that piece of getting out there and build a base of human connection. And then from that place of strength, start reaching out to people that are around you, that come across you, um, come across your path. That's going to require that you have your own solid sense of self, your own solid values, so that you can not lose your crackers when somebody really has something different. Not that you won't ever. I've lost my crackers. If you're like, what? (laughs) Right? So get the more centered in yourself and the more you're taking that exploring other people's worlds, uh, the better positioned you are to create even meaningful relationships with people that are outside your circle. And Ben, right? We're both in the military. If you're active duty, you just get moved to different stations every three or so years. And the people that are around you that you have an opportunity to build are just who you get assigned around. There's no walking out and maintaining a long set of terms, set of bowling buddies or whatever, right? So that means having that wider. And I feel like I do see a decent amount of this in the military where people will just accept and explore each other's world because you know what? These are the only people I have for the next three years. Mm hmm. Um, definitely on a submarine. If you're on a long submarine tour, <laughs> you, you can't be go up. To, could you, what is this conversation? You go up to the submarine commander and you're like, listen, I just, I really need to get some different people down in this sub. I don't really relate to anybody. You're going to go find something in commonality and you're going to let somebody talk to you about something you don't care about because you all recognize the need for each other. Right? So, Find your friends from that point of strength, differentiate, build these wider, broader social circles, explore each other's worlds, find the connection where you can explore the value that's left out there. A lot of people are living a lot, leaving a lot of value on the table. And then finally, plug in to those universal values that we all have as actually standing on your own two feet and plugging into universal values provides you a stable place of resilience to face the relational challenges and the loneliness challenges that are going to come no matter how you live your life. Thanks for listening to the Indigo Podcast. If you like this podcast, please consider helping us by rating us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen, telling your friends about us, 
having us on your podcast, or mentioning us on social media. Our website is www.indigopodcast.com, where you can access more information about us and this episode. Thanks again, and we look forward to talking with you again soon.